think the final blow off, like it's wacky and that happens quick. That's like, yeah, three months, six months. But this whole gold thing, this is long term. Like people are like, people look at the price of gold and they're like, oh, you know, I don't know if it's going to go up or it looks like it's going to go down. No, 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 no. Gold price is not going to stop going higher. You know why? Because the U.S. dollar is not going to stop going lower, right? The government's never going to cut back. The government's going to keep spending more. Gold's going to continue going higher um, for, you know, as far as we can see. Uh, but just that that last phase where it gets yeah. stupid, that's quick. That's three months, six months. Yeah. But when it enters the mania phase, do you see it as a you still have to be picking the right stock or do you see this as a rising tide raises all boats? If it's got gold in it, it's going up. It's like, what do you see? What? Go it's ahead. probably going to get stupid. As okay. It does. You know, there's one company I won't even mention, but they've been pushing this low grade uh, heat bleach in Nevada it's re refractory. It's unable to be processed. They keep changing their names and changing the story. And like, it's, you know, it's the biggest dog you've ever seen. Uh, but, you know, they formed an alliance with, uh, you know, when the silver squeeze got going on Reddit like a year or two ago, they formed an yeah. alliance with AMC, the movie company, because mm -hmm. the whole squeeze agenda. So AMC invested some uh, money in this gold company and that, you know, is a tremendous amount of hype and stuff, but like, you, yeah, when the mania happens, like companies like this are probably going to, you know, also do, take off. Do, yeah. Do yeah. All right. Hey, I'm going to steer us over to silver for a bit. Uh, some analysts are saying that silver is poised for a breakout to around $50 an ounce. What is your analysis point to? Yeah, you know, I'm there. Um, I cover the silver miners very closely and I follow the silver market very closely. Silver, the silver miners are a different animal um, because their margins are even lower than the gold miners. Like the, uh, the gold miner margin is like 53%. Uh, and that's 50% higher on a percentage than silver. Silver margins are I don't know, 25 to 30%. So they go from like boom to bust every quarter. Like the silver price goes up. All right, good quarter. Let's go, you know, develop the asset. And then it's like, oh, you know, shit, the silver price went down. Now we got to cut everything back. And it's tough. But the um the silver companies are really, really volatile, as is silver the metal. Um, central banks own gold, um, no doubt, and they're buying more and more gold. But central banks, they don't own silver. Like I've owned silver personally, you know, I've owned some gold, I've owned some silver, the gold's fine, but silver, man, you buy like $10,000 of it. It's like big, it's bulky. Like it's kind of a pain in the butt. You got to go haggle with it. So central backs don't hold it, but it is extremely uh, tied to press gold. It's a precious metal. Um, and, and when gold gets rolling, you know, silver, you know, definitely gets rolling. It just, it takes a little while longer. Um, one thing I've noticed with silver, sometimes the spikes have been quick, you know, like it goes up pretty quick and it stays there for a little while, but then it ends up coming down. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so you got to be careful with that, uh, in, uh, in the silver companies act the same way. Um, one, see, like one of the things I had a chart up, I don't know if I talked about it, but it was great as King. Um, you need to find high grade, uh, assets and resources in this market because grade uh, provides, uh, it, it allows you to get more revenue out of your ore. Um, so on a per ounce basis, your costs are lower. So high grade deposits are more profitable. And I just, I, you know, I'm on Twitter a lot and I see all these guys pushing all these low grade cow pastures. And when the silver market really gets going, yeah, you know, they're going to go up. They could go up 2X, 5X, 10X, but you know what happens the other 98% of the time? They lose money, they dilute, the share price falls continuously to zero with never actually getting there. Um, and it's just absolute, you know, not a place to be. So you, you the way you need to invest in gold and silver where you're uncertain of uh, what's gonna happen in the future. We all have an opinion, who really knows? And the best way to, uh, the best, the companies that perform the best are the ones with the highest grade assets because 
Uh, they're the most profitable when they generate free cash flow. When you generate free cash flow, you can use the issue dividends and buy back shares. And, you know, there's companies, miners out there, uh, Lundingo, Fruita del Norte, that thing's 15 grams a ton. They're buying back shares. Uh, they're issuing dividends. And that stock has done great. Uh, Silver Crest Metals, 750 gram a ton, silver equivalent, buying back shares, pay back $50 million debt in less than one year. This, this is how you need to build your portfolio. You don't, like, I'm... Don't buy junk, even though the junk's gonna fly at some point, like we don't know when. So, you know, buy quality. Makes sense, yeah. So um, the SLV, you, you, well, before I move on, you know, I think people wanna buy quality, but they also see price tag and something may be cheap and they're like, well, here's a gold, here's a silver miner, it's cheap, it's gonna go up in a frenzy, I'll just buy that. But I think your point is uh, extremely important because, they may see a 70, 80, 90% drop um, mm -hmm. at some point, and uh, they may not experience the same kind of thrust mm -hmm. when, when, when things really take off. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, you know, I had charts up earlier. One of the charts that I like to show, uh, when people think silver, um, a lot of people think of core mining, you know, core mining, right? Um, you know, they, they're a silver, uh, producer, um, and you know, they own a few gold mines and when people think silver, they're like, oh yeah, core, core mining is traded about $3 per share right now. Um, and back in 2000, you know what it was trading at? Like $300 per share. Wow. It's down 98%. Do you know why? Because their shares have increased from 2 million shares outstanding to over like 200 million shares outstanding. They are the banker's best friend and a shareholder's worst, worst enemy. The management gets paid. They live in their mansions. The bankers get rich and shareholders get screwed from the endless, endless dilution. And, you know, I get a Bloomberg. So, you know, I can I look at prices and then I can look at shares outstanding in like a, a price chart so I can see this. But it's hard to find. Like it's not in Yahoo. It's not in Google. You, you need to find the good management that are focused on creating shareholder value because the majority of miners out there, they don't care. All, they, all the management does is care about getting paid. Yeah, I mean, that's so critical. And not everyone has access to the same tool set. And even if they did, they may not understand what they're looking at. So sign up for the gold portfolio. Yeah. So sign up for the gold. <laughs> so um, you, you mentioned a moment ago about how bulky owning silver is. And so central banks really don't. But the SLV ETF price has been higher recently while shares out are decreasing. Are central banks tapping the ETF for physical silver while the retail investor is non-existent, basically not paying attention? And if so, where does that action lead? Yeah, no, the, the banks aren't buying. It's too big. Like you would have to have a ginormous warehouse to have whatever, 10 million ounces of silver. Central banks aren't buying it. But yeah, we're seeing the same thing in the SLV as we are in the GLD, just the lack of investor interest. But I tell you what, the World Silver Survey that's funded by the big silver companies that come out with um, supply and demand numbers every single year. Silver, demand for silver keeps increasing. And like, why does it keep increasing? Because of all the technology. Um, all like the, you know, uh, Tesla electrification, you know, the electric electrification, all the solar solar panel uses like a third of an ounce of silver and military like, and military uses, uh, I think a, uh, Tomahawk missile was like 300 ounces of silver in it. And, it's uh, crazy. Yeah, I, I mentioned heard that to funny. Keith Newmeyer's uh, first majesty He's like, Whoa, we, we should go, we should go, uh, mine Iraq then, you know? <laughs> um, but, you know, that's why that's kind of it's an ironic thing that's going on right now in the world where mining has just got a, such a bad name. And you have all like these, you know, greenies running around. Oh, we need clean energy. We need, you know, all this. And oh, but mining's bad. We can't use can't do mining anymore. Like, where do you think all these materials are going to come from? And, you know, exactly. copper is the same way. Like we need to in order to complete any of these green new deals or anything like we need 10 times the amount of silver, 10 times the amount of copper. It's like it's crazy. Yeah. So, you know, the gold to silver ratio historical mean is around 50, but yet yeah, has been around 80 to 90 the last several years. And I think it's around 83 or whatever right now. Some people are saying that the ratio is outdated. Is it outdated? Is it irrelevant? Or is it historically elevated and set for a mean reversion and why? Yeah, it's it's a mean reversion uh, sort of thing. Like I said, silver is very volatile. It's just the nature of the beast. So, you know, you suffer from long periods of underperformance for like 90, 95% of the time. And that 5% 
spike goes ballistic, like we saw in Coco, like the turtle traders, when a trend starts, it's like a free trade. You don't know how high it's going to go. And then when it gets out of control, then that brings the ratio up higher uh, because the it, it gets so out of whack. Um, but it's a it's a shorter term type of thing uh, based on the numbers that I've looked at, you know, within the uh, the metric. So, yeah. So because it's 95 percent of the time um, undervalued and 5% of the time it's this, in this explosive trend. Um, do you want to be in it, even have your toes dipped in it, regardless of the overall market sentiment? Like, even if it's going to take a dive, um, which would mean that those equities would dive harder, you still want to be in it because you just don't know when that thing's going to take off. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, it's just proper portfolio management. You just want to be, uh, you know, diversified, um, you know, so you have, you know, exposure to a lot of different things because you're not sure which one's going to do well, which one's not going to do well. One of, one of the things, my my gold, my golden portfolio is like 13, 14 royalty comes the GP10X. It's 30 companies. Why is it 30 companies? Because you need to diversify. You need to put a little bit in 30 companies and then you're never really sure which one's going to hit it. But like a royalty company, one or two or three is going to hit it. And then the important thing to do, like the turtle traders, is when you find one that hits it, do not sell it. Hang on to your winners. Sell your losers. If you got to sell anything, sell your losers. Because what happens in your portfolio is you get a winner. It goes up 5x, 10x, 20x. And it starts out at 3% of your portfolio. Then it becomes 10%, 20%, 50%. And then, you know, they have a good resource. So it's probably going to continue higher. Um, so your portfolio gets weighted to your good positions. And um, as your bad positions fall to zero, it doesn't even matter anymore. So you, yeah. you need to think about it that way. Yeah, that's good. So everyone is interested in the miners. They want the leverage, or at least the people on Twitter, they, they want the leverage or the torque to the metal. But as gold has moved, as you've already expressed, the miners really have not moved as fast. Now, we've seen some uh, move a little bit off the bottom, 15 20% or so. Garrett, in a recent Twitter X post, you shared when it comes to the equities, the most important quality is increasing economics on a per share basis. That's the only thing that drives share prices higher. Let me show you the way. Would you uh, detail a little bit of that? All right. You've been doing some good research. Here we go. Uh, um, all right. Can you, you all see that? I, yeah, we could see that. All right. So some of the stuff drives me crazy out there. Like this chart right here. Um, here's the gold price in blue at, you know, 23. Here's the HUI down at about 250. Now it's like an alligator, right? Gold's way up here. The gold, gold stocks are way down here. And then they're like, look at the valuation opportunity. Gold stocks are so undervalued versus the price of gold. You know, they, they, you know, they've got to go up. Uh, but you know what? It's wrong and it's misleading. They, they don't understand the economics. Now, this is a uh, gold price versus oh the, this is the gold price versus the shares outstay you know what let me switch to this one this is the gold price versus the operating cash flow of the miners uh, based on you know my I covered 80 miners here's all the big ones um, so basically uh, you know as the gold price spikes operating cash flow you know spikes higher. Um, and then the only economic metric that matters is um, driving economics on a per share basis. You need to increase your earnings per share in, in, in order to push your stock price higher. Now, looking at this chart, you'll see operating cash flow per share down low and the gold price you know, up high. And uh, the reason for that is because of dilution. Um, you know, the miners are making more now, but they've also diluted their shares over the past 10 or 15 or 20 years. So as a result, earnings on a per share basis have declined. Now, the last one right here, this is the HUI index. Um, it's, you know, it's an older index. It's got a longer history than GDX. I like using it for longer term charts versus operating cash flow per share. So you can see how the HUI tracks operating cash flow per share. Um, and right now they're pretty close. So on uh, on a, on a um, per share basis, you know the gold stocks are basically they're they're fundamentally equally valued right now based off the gold price, based off earnings per share, um, and based off the 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 amount amount of money that they make. Uh, we just need you know we need higher gold prices to push these margins higher. Um, and that makes sense. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of companies, yeah. they get away with this, you know, like they, I've seen companies grow from 100,000 ounces to a million ounces of production over the past, you know, say five, 10 years, and their stock price goes down 80%. Why? Because it's dilutive growth. Their shares went from 5 million to 500 million. So economics on a per share basis has declined tremendously. And like I said, a lot of companies don't care about this. And their bonuses, if they go from 100,000 to a million, they get bonuses. It doesn't matter how many earnings per share that they got. Their contracts so are negotiated earnings per share. Yeah. So on that concept of, of share dilution, as the price of gold and silver rises and revenue rises and likely profit rises, do you expect the miners to buy back shares to reduce the outstanding share counts in order to reverse the dilution that they created when they were raising money? And did the miners take this action in the previous bull run in mass? Yeah, you know, um, it, it kind of... There's, it kind of never happens. Like they're never going to buy back all the shares that they've issued. issued. But there's a company uh, that I mentioned earlier, um, uh, Lindine Gold, that was yeah. for Del Norte. They make so much money that they can buy back shares, uh, that they can issue dividends. Silvercrest Metals, they make enough money uh, that they can buy back shares and issue dividends. The average mining company does not make enough money. But one thing to think of too is, um, you know, a mine, a mine, like 10 year mine life, 20 year mine life. It's a terminal asset, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, you look at tech stocks that you project 3%, 4% growth for, 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 for perpetuity uh, for like an iPhone or for Google or for anything like that. But miners don't do that. It's a terminal asset. So when's a mine worth the most? Yesterday. When's it worth less? Tomorrow. Because they, they mine out their reserve and you have less ounces in the reserve tomorrow than you did today. So um, the mine value declines as time goes by. Now, of, you know, with that in thought, the Australian mining industry is really old school. Like it's like the same as the seventies. There's companies there that, that treat it like a terminal asset. So all the money that they make, they issue to shareholders in the form of dividends. They do share buybacks um, and they, they get it out to shareholders instead of trying to, uh, you know, find another asset and, uh, you know, via exploration or something like that. And exploration, there's a lot of value created, but it's like uh, betting on which tree is going to get hit by lightning. You're betting on one in a hundred. You're, it's, you're rolling the dice. So instead of rolling the dice for shareholder money, they return capital. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, the majors have become more by fiduciary responsible over the past 20 years because they get stupid when they make a lot of money over pay for acquisitions. And to be honest with you, that's probably what's going to happen again. Like uh, Ken Ross, there was a guy running Ken Ross Tide Bird. He paid $8 billion for Redback Resources for Tassius in 2011. It was like the most egregious deal you've ever seen. And uh, they finally have it going and it's going in the right direction. But um, we'll likely see the majors just pull the same stunt again as the gold price gets going. <laughs> Once it gets up there. Yeah. So as you as you've stated, miners trade on their margins when gold is not seen by the investor class as a needed asset. When the investor class psychology changes and they view gold as a highly needed asset and they pile into it, do the miners still trade on margins at that point or do they behave more like other assets have when FOMO kicks in and trade more on the asset class sentiment rather than margins and fundamentals? Yeah, like, um, you know, every asset trades differently based on its fundamental, fundamental uh, characteristics and um, cash flows and capex needed. So, you know, I think miners are fairly valued right here. But uh, when you look at past manias and, you know, when it gets all wacky, you know, the multiples go out the window. Um, so, you know, I we haven't seen any sort of disconnect regarding that. You know, miners are still fairly valued here. Um, and when the mania gets going, we're going to see some, you know, wacky stuff going on and the multiples will get expanded. People will pay ridiculous amounts for assets, as as we saw with Red back in 2011. And we are just light years. The, the majors aren't even buying stuff right now. They're still selling stuff. We're light years away from that. Yeah, yeah. So, but that, you expect that to be a fairly short window of time, you know, a few months to six months, nine months. I was uh, talking, I was, I was talking like the final blow off, like it's wacky and that happens quick. That's like, yeah, three months, six months, but this whole gold thing, this is long-term. Like people are like, people look at the price of gold and they're like, oh, you know, I don't know if it's going to go up or it looks like it's going to go down. No, 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 no. 
gold price is not going to stop going higher. You know why? Because the U.S. dollar is not going to stop going lower, right? The government's never going to cut back. The government's going to keep spending more. Gold's going to continue going higher um, for, you know, as far as we can see. Uh, but just that that last phase where it gets yeah. stupid, that's quick. That's three months, six months. Yeah, six months. Yeah. 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 So y- you've written about your liking for a few silver miners. Uh, Gary, yeah. will you detail what it is about IS Silver and Silver Crest specifically that you like and what kind of move do you expect in those stocks uh, that they could make if silver does reach your $50 target? Yeah, I'm, you know, I've been covering the silver miners really closely for years. Um, as far as like operating silver companies, there's probably eight uh like legit ones silver explorers is probably 20 maybe like it is tiny it is a a tiny pool of assets and if it ever gets crazy with silver like you can have a lot of money coming it'll get it'll get stupid but um you know uh, with all my trips i've been down to bolivia a lot mexico a lot and i keep running into um you know this geologist peter maga doctors peter maga is a legend in the industry and you know a friend of mine and uh, his claim to fame is he discovered uh, Mags Juan Scipio on his first drill hole, and Fresnel was right there. They let the rights go. They thought the they thought the ore body got eroded very away. Peter's like, nah, let me. I think it went deeper. So they dug a hole and they hit like the best silver mine in the world, Juan Scipio, by Mag Silver. And um, Peter sent me an article, and it was from like the 80s or 90s, and it was um, Greatest King, and it was uh, about Archie uh, Bell, who was a head of exploration at Naranda. And they needed like a, a quick back the envelope calculation to determine mine profitability because they didn't want to waste their time looking at uneconomic deposits. They wanted to, uh, you know, find the profitable ones. And then bottom line of the article, quick story short, grade is king. The higher grade, the better. If you don't have high grade, you're not going to make any money. The three quarters of the silver miners out there, they don't make any money. They grind away at profitability. They um, they uh, obfuscate their cash costs. They use byproducts to make it appear as if they're making money. They're not making money. They're dilutive instruments. Uh, but there are some that are extremely high grade. Silver Crest, so it's less chispous, 750 grams a ton. It's one of the highest grades in the world. Mag Silver owns one of Scipio. It's like 650 grams a ton. Um, and it's a massive, massive ore body with huge wide whisk. Um, and Aya, Aya is about 200 grams a ton, but it's, um, you know, it's in Morocco. It's un- un- unexplored. They've never explored there over the past 100 years in this uh, modern era for silver. Um, and they have a, this is a gounder, which is an enormous ore body that they haven't even dis- found the, the extents of it. And they're expanding to 2.7 tons per day, like this upcoming uh, quarter. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it looks like a tremendous opportunity. And then the grade leads to profitability, leads to being able to buy back shares, being able to uh, issue dividends and to avoid shareholder dilution. So I like the high grade ones. Yeah, it's outstanding. Um, so before we wrap up here and I ask Garrett our final question, I want to point everyone over to our Substack. It's free. Go to metalsandminers.substack.com. We post free content on the consumer, economy, markets, artificial intelligence, individual metals and miners, and all of the interviews that we conduct. And when you subscribe, we want to give you a free gift. It's a report that we wrote based on an important Ray Dalio foundational premise. It's titled, If You Don't Own Gold, You Know Neither History Nor Economics. This free gift is a must read for everyone on why we all should own gold. So head over to metalsandminers.substack.com and put in your email address to subscribe and receive the free gift on us. Also, if you've enjoyed this conversation with Garrett as much as I have, Will you please let him know, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button and leave a comment below this video. All right. Okay, Garrett, in wrapping up our discussion, I've got a final question for you. We've been discussing this historically epic bull run setting up for the precious metals. Do you expect a huge slam of the metal prices right before the bull run take off? And if so, do you expect a V-shaped bounce back? And how are you preparing for this? Are you not yet invested in the miners? Are you partially invested with some dry powder? Or are you fully invested due to the expectation that smart money will pounce in and there won't be enough to go around due to the small size of the sector? 
Yeah, um, I think we're seeing the volatility here. Just, you know, think back to 2008, like how crazy it all was and how crazy gold was. And, the, you know, Lehman going out of business and Bear Stearns going out of business and gold being down 150 bucks and then gold being up 150 bucks. It was crazy. But in the end, the Fed comes in and they provide stimulus and they blow out their balance sheet with trillions of dollars of liquidity. Um, and we are moving in. I don't know what the next crisis is going to be. It could be commercial real estate, but I think we're moving in like we're close based on the timing. Um, so you just need to maintain a diversified portfolio so that you can sleep at night. And then, you know, one of the things that I've done, the the returns on my golden portfolio, the the royalty product, they're so persistent um, and they're so robust that you can run a hedge portfolio on it. Um, the GDXJ or a lot of smaller explorers, it's an ETF. Um, so basically, you know, you can short that one because it's so dilutive. Uh, you know, they keep issuing shares and then you uh, maintain your long positions in the golden portfolio. So what I've learned is that, you know, by doing that, then you're exposed to all the G, uh, all the GDX price performance from about 1% to all the way negative or positive for the hedge gold portfolio. When it gets above that in a real wacky gold period, the, the golden portfolio, the unhedged one does better. But, you know, over the longer term, you know, I, um, you know, I prefer to run the hedge gold portfolio for my, for myself because it's more consistent. It ekes out gains almost on a daily basis and it's a straight line higher with a higher sharp ratio. But, you know, um, me being a fundamental analyst and looking at valuations and stuff like that and looking at grade and looking at asset size, um, you know, I'm starting to uh, stumble across, you know, a, real, a lot of really good underpriced opportunities. Um, and, you know, those ones I'm, you know, building, you know, pos positions with. Uh, you know, position myself for the long term. And, you know, one of the things with the smaller uh, explorers is um, you need to find the asset, uh, the value creators, the guys that have done it before, the guys that, you know, some of these companies are lifestyle companies, like they don't make any money. The only reason they exist is to pay their management a few hundred thousand dollars a year. They're dilutive. Um, so there's good guys and there's bad guys in the sector. And I've been in the industry for 15 years. I have a lot of friends um, and they're good guys and a lot of the value creators. I've aligned myself with the good people. So, you know, I find the good projects with grade that are paired up with the, you know, the, the good people in the industry. And I'm, I'm starting to get exposure to them right now because, you know, gold's making all time new highs. Um, and you, you, you want to stay ahead of the trend um, and maintain your portfolio that way. Okay. So it sounds to me like what you're saying is, is that you are invested. I don't, are you fully invested or are you uh, keeping some dry powder on the sideline for that eventual drop that, you know, like you discussed in 08, are you, yeah. are you keeping some there so that you can also enter or are you just building your positions and, and you're going to ride out that, that initial drop down and yeah. then watch it spike higher? Yeah, the the hedge gold portfolio, it's so boring. It's like watching paint dry, but it's 24 karat gold paint. It just keeps churning it out every single day. Um, but, you know, the reason you invest in the in the miners and the gold miners and silver miners is for that really explosive move. Um, and, you know, when that happens, we're going to be we're going to be up at two in the morning, probably chatting to each other. Right. Watching the gold right. rise five hundred dollars. Um, so that's the thing that we're all waiting for. Uh, but the thing like I am like I am pessimistic about the economy that a 2008 type scenario keeps coming back to me that's the only thing that leads me to uh, you know be cautious here and looking back at my data and looking back at statistics and I do a lot of quant stuff every time the yield curve has gone negative there has been a financial disaster and I'm waiting for the next one and okay. In 2000, no, the, the silver, the silver squeeze, that was what, 2019, 2020? Yeah. Um, silver got smoked to like, what was it, $12 an ounce or something like that? And I'm looking at the economics, the cash costs were like $15. All the miners were bankrupt. I'm like, the, the silver price is way too low. So on a fundamental basis, I just knew. So I loaded up on calls. Um, on silver at 12. And then when the silver squeeze happened and silver went to 30, they were worth a lot of money. Um, and I should have sold them that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Garrett, thank you for coming on to the Metals and Miners podcast, for being so generous with your time, your analysis, your ideas. It's really been great to spend the time with you. 
Will you please tell the viewers any final thoughts that you want to share with those tuning in, where they can learn more about your work and how they can connect with you? Um, yeah, you know, Garrett Goggin, uh, goldenportfolio.com. Um, and then, you know, I'm on Twitter a lot. So Garrett Goggin um, at Twitter or X or whatever it's called now. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, I look forward to having you back on, Garrett. It's been great. Thank you for being here and everybody else. Thank you for watching. Great. Thanks, Gary. I want to point everyone over to our Substack. It's free. Go to metalsandminers.substack.com. We post free content on the consumer, economy, markets, artificial intelligence, individual metals and miners, and of course, all of the interviews that we conduct. And when you subscribe, we want to give you a free gift. It's a report that we wrote based on an important Ray Dalio foundational premise titled, If You Don't Own Gold, You Know Neither History Nor Economics. This free gift is a must read for everyone on why we all should own gold. So head over to metalsandminers.substack.com, put in your email address to subscribe. It's free and get the free gift. All